We're very happy that uh, you have been participating in our seminar at the beginning of a new year. This is the last part of the seminar, Faith and Unity in Difficult Times. Yes, we are living in some challenging times. We are living by the events that we are looking at clearly in the last days. And as we approach the second coming of Jesus Christ, we find that it's going to get more and more difficult. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, as Apostle Paul was writing his very last letter, just before his execution, he writes, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Yes, we are living in perilous times. Right now, as we are looking at the devastation that the diseases have been happening upon this world, COVID-19, this is already coming into the second year. For those who are not affected by it, they think that there's nothing to do with us. It's just all a hoax. But to those who have lost loved ones, to those who have lost people that they were close to, this disease has created devastation. And yet we know that more dangerous things are going to be happening around us. Yes, this could be a man-made disease. Yes, we understand that. We understand also that the cure is probably going to be worse than the disease at times. Yeah, the things that people are trying to do, the vaccinations, all these things. And we know that we're living in these last days. How do you survive that? Especially when you look at society. What's happening with society? In corresponding to these diseases and hurricanes and earthquakes and all these type of tragedies, what is happening to the moral condition of society? Apostle Paul continues, For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Yes, we can see these things clearly in society around us. We can see that these are all social issues, issues relating between one and another. That's what this is all about. And the corruption of society socially is clearly a sign of the last days. And correspondingly, as society is getting more and more corrupted, the Spirit of God is being withdrawn from the world. And we can see these pestilences, these diseases. We can see the nature is all turning upside down. And it's going to get worse as society is becoming morally corrupt. And it goes on in verse 6. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers' lusts. Yeah, that's what's happening immorality is on the increase. The more immorality is on the increase, the more all these other social issues are coming more and more to the forefront. We find that God's spirit is moving away from the world. And as society is decaying, what happens to understanding? What happens to reason. We find this in verse 7. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. 
Yes, today in the midst of all of this society, education is becoming something greater to have than anything else before. Before, people would learn a trade. People would learn those type of things, and they considered that of value. And now the value is to get an education. And yes, they are ever learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And as a result, what happens? What happens as we get more educated populations? What happens in regard to something we call faith? Jesus prophesied this in Luke 18, verse 8. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on earth? When Jesus comes again the second time, faith is going to be something scarce. Why is it? The reason being is you can go down to that principles of education. Yeah, as we look at that period of time called the last days that Apostle Paul was writing about, as people get more educated, they have less faith. Why is that? What is the principles of false education that makes this a problem? We find this in Councils to Parents, Teachers, and Students, page 64. There is an education which is essentially worldly. I want you to stop and think about this. Here is a description of worldly education and its principles. Let me read it again. There is an education which is essentially worldly. Its aim is success in the world. The gratification of selfish ambition. To secure this education, many students spend time and money in crowding their minds with unnecessary knowledge. The world accounts them learned. But God is not in their thoughts. Yes, sometimes we need to go to university. I understand that. We can have people that are like Daniel who went to the Babylonian university and he came out of that university untouched. Yeah, that, that's a possibility. Why? Because he understood the reasons for education. And here, worldly education is built upon success in the world and gratification of selfish ambition. Now, what happens with worldly education? What happens when you contrast it with true education? Notice 1 Corinthians 1, verse 23. Yeah, the Greeks were so into education. And the educational systems that we have today are completely based on that educational system in Greece. And what does Apostle Paul say in 1 Corinthians 1.23? But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. What do you find here? What do you see here when you're looking at these two educational systems? You see, the educational system of Christ is what? Is the crucifixion. Yeah, Christ crucified. And when the people of the world look at Christ crucified, to those who are Jews, to those who understand the truth, to them it's a stumbling block. And of course, to the ones who are educated in the Greek system of education, it is considered foolishness. And so what does God do? What, what happens with this type of educational system? We go to 1 Corinthians 1, verse 20 and 25. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolishness the wisdom of the world? Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. If God's principles and worldly principles are directly contrary one to another. 
And so when you're looking at that system of worldly education, they're ever learning but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And this is why Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 1.21, for after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Yeah, God uses something completely different. Completely different than what people can expect. They want to see things tangible. And God uses preaching to change the lives of people. And yet to us, to the believer, this true educational system contrasting with the worldly, what is it? 1 Corinthians 1.18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. It centers on the crucifixion. It centers on the cross. That is the power of God. And what else is it in verse 24? But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Yes, this is what it is. The power of God is found in the cross of Christ and the wisdom of God is found in the cross of Christ. Yes, the wisdom, education, truth education. That's what you find. You find it in the cross of Christ. And unless we understand this principle of true education, what's going to happen to us? In Mind, Character, and Personality, Volume 1, page 53, it says, now as never before, we need to understand the true science of education. If we fail to understand this, we shall never have a place in the kingdom of God. You understand this? If we don't understand the true science of education, we're never going to be saved. And if you look at history, especially the book, Studies in Christian Education by E.A. Sutherland, he shows clearly that a lack of true education in Protestantism led them to reject the first angel's message. And for us today, if we don't understand the true science of education, we're not going to have a place in the kingdom of God. Do you want to be saved? Then you need to understand the true science of education. Now, we have been talking about administration. This is coming from in this seminar about church administration. And we're going to be having seminars every two months to be able to understand our responsibilities. So when we're talking about church responsibilities, what do you think is the essential need in fulfilling church responsibilities? You know what it is? We find this in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 24. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up the cross and follow me. Here it is as we're beginning this new year. It's a good time for us to reflect that True education is contrasted to earthly, worldly education. The worldly education is based upon having financial success, having personal things that benefit me personally. And true education, the wisdom of God, is found in the cross of Christ. And here Jesus says that you and I need to take up the cross. So now, what is the fundamental distinction between true education and worldly education. What's the fundamental distinction? Fundamentals of Christian education, page 387. Education means much more than many suppose. True education embraces physical, mental, and moral training in order that all the powers shall be fitted for the best development to do service for God and to work for the uplifting of humanity. Remember, 
Worldly education is to build ourselves up, to have personal success, for people to look at us and say, wow, this is a, this is a learned individual. But what about true education? What does true education do? It says here, it's, yes, developing all of our powers to the fullest capacity. For what reason? To serve. Yeah, the act of service. To uplift people, to uplift humanity. That is the purpose of true education. So when we think about church responsibilities... And yeah, when you think about administration, we have to think about church responsibilities, church departments. Why do we have so many responsibilities in the church? Notice here some of the responsibilities. We have leadership in various roles. You have church leaders. You have unit leadership, presidents, general conference president, and vice president. All these things, these are all involved in leadership. And then you have the secretarial part, secretaries and all of these things. You have those that are dealing with finance. You're dealing with the treasury. You have Sabbath school leaders, Sabbath school teachers. You have children's teachers. You have youth teachers. You have music leadership. You have media and web outreach. We need these things. These are all things that are involved in various levels of church administration. And then you have the departments. Well, we're not going to mention the Sabbath school department. We already mentioned that. But yes, on the general conference level, you have the Sabbath school department preparing things. Then you have the educational department in all its phases from elementary school all the way through missionary schools. You have the family department. You have youth department. You have missionary department. You have the medical missionary department. We have the publishing department. And then, of course, you need to get out the publication, so you have the culperter department. You have stewardship department. You have the welfare department. And there's many, many more that we have. Many other offices on a local level as well as on a general conference level. You have all these responsibilities. Why do we have so many different responsibilities? And you know, as a church gets bigger, you need to have more responsibilities. Why is that? Why do we have to do that? Matthew chapter 16, 24 again. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Why? Because we need to take up the cross. Yeah, conversion has a natural cost. Yeah, denial of self and taking up the cross. That's, that's what it is. And this is why it's important for us at the beginning of this year to do some serious soul searching. In Luke chapter 14, verse 28 to 30, after speaking about taking up the cross, Jesus says, for which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost whether he have sufficient to finish it? Lest haply after he had laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Yeah, here, here is the situation here. In order to take up the cross, you need to first of all count the cost. And at the beginning of the year is a good time for us to count the cost. How much does it cost me to be a Christian? How much does it cost me to be a follower of Christ? And am I willing to pay that cost? And this is why this was so important in regards to cross-bearing. So now... How is the cross a daily part of my life? How do I come into the cross all the time? Prophets and Kings, page 220 to 221. The call to place all on the altar of service comes to each one. 
We are not all asked to serve as Elisha served, nor are we all bidden to sell everything we have. But God asks us to give his service the first place in our lives. To allow no day to pass without doing something to advance his work on earth. This is the cross that we have. We may not have to sell everything we have. That's true. That may not be our experience. But every day, are you doing something to advance the work of God on earth? Are you doing something of that nature? You see, when we are converted... When we experience genuine conversion, something happens to us. And we find this in the experience of Jesus at the well with that woman at the well in John chapter 4, verse 14. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. I want you to look at this very carefully. When we accept the water of life in our heart, it actually becomes a spring in us. In other words, we share with others. That's the natural result of conversion. And this is why in the Zara of Ages 195, every true disciple is born into the kingdom of God as a missionary. You understand this? The moment we are converted, the moment we are born again, that moment we become a missionary. Yes, so let's read it again. Every true disciple is born into the kingdom of God as a missionary. He who drinks of the living water becomes a fountain of life. The receiver becomes a giver. The grace of Christ in the soul is like a spring in the desert welling up to refresh all and making those who are ready to perish eager to drink of the water of life. Yes, when people see us and they see what we have, they want to have the same thing. They want to drink of the same life that we have. They want to have that experience. Now, the question is, why is the cross the centerpiece of the Christian life. And here, obviously, we're not just talking about the cross of Christ, but Jesus says, now you must take up the cross. Why is it that when we're talking about true education, it's connected to the cross? And when we talk about worldly education, it's talking about pleasure. Why is that? The two things, they're, they're contrary to each other. Why is that? Why is the cross so important? And what does the cross do to me personally? What happens when I truly accept the cross of Jesus Christ? What happens at that moment? You know, this wonderful statement here is found in John 15, verse 11. Look what it says here. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. I want you to stop and look at this. Everything that Jesus tells us is so that we can experience joy. So when I deny myself and I take up the cross in order to do the things that God asked us to do, which is serving others, when we do that, that's how we experience joy in our life. Do you want that kind of joy? Yeah. What happens if you decide, no, I don't want that. I want the other type of system. I don't want to be constantly serving. Yeah, constantly being asked to do something. 
I want a little bit more peace. I want to relax and do nothing. I want pleasure. What happens then? Notice here, Pages from Prophets, page 600. Man is doing the greatest injury and injustice to his own soul when he thinks and acts contrary to the will of God. No real joy can be found in the path forbidden by him who knows what is best and who plans for the good of his creatures. The path of transgression leads to misery and destruction, but wisdom's ways are ways of pleasantness and all her paths are peace. Yeah, that's the choice that is right here before us. It seems that the worldly way is the best way because it benefits us. That's what it seems. But the end is destruction. Not only in the future life, but even in this life. But here, if we follow God's path, the path of service, we're going to find great joy. Now let's look at the example of Jesus. What brought him joy? What was it that encouraged him in his life as he was going to the road to the crucifixion? Yes, his whole life was a life of service on the road to the crucifixion. And yet he was happy. What brought him happiness? What brought him peace? What brought him that true joy? Hebrews 12 verse 2 tells us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. What was it in the life of Jesus? He looked to the joy of souls being saved. And that helped him all the way through. And this is why this principle in the life of Jesus is to be our principle if we want true happiness. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 8, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So here is Jesus. He was God. He was equal to God. All the angelic hosts were there to serve him. And yet he in turn served them. And then not only did he serve them, he saw us in this world and he came to serve sinners. Yeah, people who were rejecting the government of God. He came to win us back to Jesus Christ, to God. How? By service. He became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And what did Jesus find in that? What did Jesus find in that kind of service? Signs of the Times, November 25th, 1903. Christ found his highest joy in service. Not to be ministered unto, but to minister. Did he come to this earth? See him teaching in the temple, by the sea, on the mountainside, in the great thoroughfares of travel. See him by the bedside of the sick, speaking peace and hope to the afflicted. He went about doing good, comforting the mourners, helping the helpless, healing the wounds that sin has made. Yeah, see Jesus doing all those things. And when he ministered to somebody, that brought him joy and happiness. Do you want joy and happiness in your life? Then follow the experience of Jesus Christ. And not only Jesus, what about the angels? Let's look at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. But to which of the angels said he at any time, sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? What is the work of angels? Those powerful, mighty angels, their work is serving others. That is their work. 
And what happens the moment one soul is saved? What happens that through ministry, when one soul gives their heart to Jesus Christ as their personal Savior? Luke 15, verse 7. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. What is in heaven? What happens to the angels? They are full of joy. Yeah, that's why Signs of the Times, March 28, 1895. The cross of Christ is the mighty agency through which God has planned to move the world. Christ, as the atoning sacrifice, has influenced the heavenly intelligences to such a degree that it is their highest joy to work as messengers of Christ to minister unto those who shall be heirs of salvation. Angels' highest joy is to be messengers of Jesus Christ, to do service for humanity. That is their highest joy. And what about us? What about you and me? Where do we find our highest joy? You know, before the crucifixion, the disciples were arguing who is going to be the greatest. Why? Because in their mind, they were affected by worldly education. Yeah, the Jewish people at the time of Christ were heavily influenced by the Greek educational system. That's why they were unprepared to see Jesus Christ and accept him. Now, the disciples, they were influenced by that too. So they were looking who is going to be the greatest. Who is going to serve me? And they come there in the upper room. Their feet are tired and dusty. And now somebody needs to wash somebody else's feet. They look around. There's no servant. Oh, I'm not the servant. That's not my educational system. My educational system is that you serve me. And so what does Jesus do? He washes their feet. And then what does he say in the act of service, this act of ministry in John 13, verse 17? If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. Yes, the source of happiness is service. When you serve others, there is joy and happiness that money cannot buy. Yeah, we can look at our wages and sometimes we talk about people, we invite them to be in the work. They look at the wages and say, oh, I can't work for that little. I have a family to support. And they go out and do other things and what happens? They miss out on that joy and happiness because joy and happiness is found in serving others. That I may know him, page 123. Clad in his meekness and lowliness, they find their highest joy in doing his service. Earthly ambition gives way to a desire to serve the master. The highest joy that anyone can have is in ministry. And this is why not only do we have those who are employed in the ministry of the gospel, we have so many things that are dependent upon people volunteering their time. And so, yes, we have a new year. New elections of officers in local churches have taken place. The question is, have you entered into that service of joy? Is that what you are going to do for this next year? You see, because that's the whole purpose of education. Genuine cross-bearing means service, but then in return, it brings us happiness. And that's what God wants from you and me. This is why when we talk about going to heaven, when we talk about going to our heavenly home, when are we going to go to our heavenly home to an eternal life of joy and happiness? When do we go there? When we as a church experience something, and what is that? Volume 9, page 116 to 117. The work of God in this earth can never be finished until the men and women 
comprising our church membership rally to the work and unite their efforts with those of ministers and church officers. Yes, that's right. So what we find here is that God's work in this earth will never be finished. We never get to go to our heavenly home where we experience eternal joy and happiness until what happens? Until all of the church members rally to the work and unite with ministers and church officers. Yeah, some people think, oh, the ministry has to do the work. They need to finish the work. We pay them for that. Other people tell me, oh, it's the lay members. The lay members will finish the work. And guess what? It's neither one. It's going to be when all of us are united together and prepared for eternal joy. Why? Because we have joy here. How do you get joy here? It's the joy of serving others. And that's why we're going to have the seminars that we're having for the rest of this year and into next year. We're planning every other month to have a seminar by one of the departments. And it's good for you to attend all of them. But if you cannot attend all of them, at least attend those that you have interest in so that you can understand what you need to do to be more useful in the service of Jesus Christ. And that's why what we need in the church today when we talk about those in leadership role, what is their role? We find this in Gospel Workers 198. But many pastors fail in not knowing how or in not trying to get the full membership of the church actively engaged in the various departments of church work. What does this mean practically? That means... That when we are preparing people for baptism, we're already thinking on what involvement they can have in the church. So that the moment they are baptized, they have a responsibility. Yeah, they have a responsibility. Why? Every member needs to be working. And our work as ministers, our work as those in leadership, is to make sure that every church member is working. Let me read that again. But many pastors fail in not knowing how or in not trying to get the full membership of the church actively engaged in the various departments of church work. If pastors would give more attention to getting and keeping their flock actively engaged at work, they would accomplish more good, have more time for study and religious visiting, and also avoid many causes of friction. Yeah, we need to do religious visiting. Yes, we need to make sure that we are studying spiritual things so we can feed the flock of God. And you can't do that if you're trying to resolve problems all the time. Why is there problems? Because people are not working. Why are people not working? We haven't given them work to do. We look at them and say, oh, they're not capable. Oh, they're too young. Oh, they're too inexperienced. Oh, no, we need to train them. We need to give them that experience. Our work is to make sure that they are actively involved. That's why it's so important for us to hold these seminars. I know it's better for us to actually be doing them in person but we can't be everywhere in person. And thank the Lord we have this opportunity, at least right now, to share with each of us what we need to be doing. But we need to also understand that in order to be successful, we need to be together. Togetherness and unity, this is critical for us. And here it is, 2021 already. And what's happening in society? Society is still concerned with something we call COVID-19. Yeah, it's been already more than a year. It's already in its second year going on its way in some places already a year and a half into it. You know, why is that? All this stuff, what is happening with us? People are practicing something called social distancing, keeping away from each other, mask wearing. Some places are mandated. And then what happens? Even when you're driving car alone, they say you need to have a mask on. I can't believe that. You know, in Southern California uh, earlier uh, last year, and I saw somebody jogging by themselves with a mask on. It's unbelievable. 
okay? Some people say, oh, as soon as you leave your house, you need to have it on. And even today I was reading something, and it says there, even when you're with your family in your home, you should have the mask on. When churches are being closed, all of these things, in the midst of all these pandemics and the world coming to an end, we can see prophecy fulfilling around us. What is the message for us today? What is God's message? We find this in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25. It says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see that day approaching. As we see the events, the signs of the times happening, we see the second coming of Christ is approaching. The more we see that, the more we need to be gathering together. Yes, the more we need church gatherings. The more we need those type of things. Why is it? Why is it that we need fellowship with one another? Why is that a necessity? In 1888 Materials, page 1682, especially have you lost much by not taking your place in religious assemblies, placing yourselves under the most healthful influences in the channel of light. The precious opportunities for witnessing for Christ ought never to seem unessential. Yeah, we need to place ourselves in the channel of light, in the most healthful influences. And then it goes on. Do you not know that when the people of God assemble to worship Him as earnest, active witnesses, they receive a rich blessing? They are Christ's representatives, and He is in the midst to bless. Yeah, we find all these things are happening around us. Churches are being closed. We're not allowed to be able to meet together. And yet we need fellowship one with another. We need that type of unity. So what do we see happening in the world around us? What is it that the early church experienced when they were gathering together? And we can see this, God's people need fellowship, especially in the last days. And instead, what do we get? Acts chapter 8, verse 1. And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So what was going on here? We find persecution. The church was growing. And as the church was growing, persecution came and scattered them. And yet it says we're supposed to be gathering together. We're supposed to have fellowship one with another. And here they were being persecuted. Why? Why was there persecution in the church? And the, the question comes to me, why COVID-19? Why churches closed? Why is it that so many places, oh, you cannot meet more than 10 at a time? You know, 10 or less needs to be gathered together. Why is that? Does God send that to us? Is that God's message to us today to scatter us in this time when we need to be united? Well, let's take a look. Acts the Apostles, page 105. The persecution that came upon the church in Jerusalem resulted in giving a great impetus to the work of the gospel. Success had attended the ministry of the word in that place. And there was danger that the disciples would linger too long, unmindful of the Savior's commission to go into all the world. This is a message for us today. You know, we are gathering in centers. We want to be more and more together. There's places where we have hundreds of members in the same city. And God has said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And when we want hundreds of members in the same city, we say what? Let's build the bigger church so we can all fit into one church. And then the restrictions come in and say, you can't have more than 10 together. What's the good of that building that we have just built when we can't even gather together in that building? Well, praise the Lord for things like that is all I can say. Why is that? Let's continue on. Forgetting that strength to resist evil 
is best gained by aggressive service, they began to think that they had no work so important as that of shielding the church in Jerusalem from the attacks of the enemy. Instead of educating the new converts to carry the gospel to those who had not heard it, they were in danger of taking a course that would lead all to be satisfied with what had been accomplished. That's the problem. We get satisfied so easily, especially when we start seeing things. We start seeing buildings, and in our mind it starts becoming that that's the center of everything, that that is what it means to be gathering together. That's what it means to be united. And we become satisfied, and then we begin to die. And I love this next part. Notice what it says here. To scatter his representatives abroad, where they could work for others, God permitted persecution to come upon them. I know COVID-19 and its restrictions are not really persecution. That's not persecution. If we think that's persecution, we don't know what we're talking about. But it's accomplishing a purpose, especially when it says no more than 10 together. And oh, I love that. I love that, those restrictions. Those are restrictions that are good for us. Those are restrictions that we actually need. Because when the church in Jerusalem through persecution was dispersed to all the regions, what happened as a result? Notice Acts chapter 8 verse 4. This is the result. Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Who was preaching the word? It wasn't just the apostles. It wasn't just a few leaders. All those people that were sent out everywhere, they became preachers. And yeah, if we have a church of a hundred people, yeah, it would be nice to see them divided into 15 little groups and every one of them being a preacher. Yes, I appreciate online ministry. I appreciate the fact that we're able to come to you today in the comfort of your home to share this message together with you through media. I believe in media. I've been using media now ever since 1991. I was quite actively involved since that time in media ministry in its various phases. But brethren, that does not supply the need of personally gathering together. And especially in smaller groups, in smaller companies, meeting together in those little groups. I was just talking to somebody just the other day. In their state, they are just been restricted to having no more than 10 people in the church. And they were talking about closing down their church, and I asked them why. Yes, meet with the re restrictions, yes. Meet with 10, but again, leave room for visitors. Yeah, so, so maybe five or six people gathered together in one church and allowing visitors to come in. And then what? And then open the homes. What about home churches? What about opening the doors of our home, inviting our neighbors to come in, inviting other people saying, yes, come on in. Yes, okay, if they tell me I have to wear a mask, okay, I'm willing to wear a mask for that purpose. I, I'm, not so, I, I'm not so convinced on it. Yes, that may be true. But for the sake of the gospel, am I willing to take up the cross and bear, wear the mask for a few hours? Yes, I'm willing to do that. If I'm willing to go to a store that says you cannot enter in here without a mask, I'm willing to do it for that. Am I willing to do it for the gospel's sake? Yes, I am. Does that mean I'm going to give up everything when it comes to vaccinations and everything else? No, I'm not going to do that. That's, that's affecting me personally. But I can do some of these things and sacrifice and take up the cross daily and follow Jesus. Why? Because we want to have the gospel to the world. We want to be able to reach out to those people. We want to be able to reach out to the world that is coming out there. And we've been gathering together in one church, in a whole city, and neglecting all those other places. Yes, still meet in that church. Yes, you can do the live recordings and everything else for those who don't have the capacity to come into this, this manner. But yes, open up your doors of your homes. Open that up. And yes, God will bless us. And yes, the laws are going to become even more restrictive. I understand that. So what do we do then? What happens when the laws are totally restricted and say, you can't meet at all? Well, then maybe it's time for Acts chapter 5, verse 29. 
because the apostles were also forbidden to preach in the name of Jesus Christ. And what did they do? Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. Yes, there is a place for social media. And here we are, you can see there, we're actually teaching at the uh, Plymouth Leadership College online. We were uh, actually had to cancel classes uh, for some of us, but they were still able to have some in the class for a little while there. And uh, thank the Lord we could use media. And I thank the Lord for that. We do need social media. But it does not take the place of personally gathering together. We need two or three are gathered together. We need that type of experience. And this is why Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 20, verse 20 says, And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. Yes, going from house to house. What about if we have a pastor? Yeah, he cannot visit everybody at one time. But what about if he goes to the church, does his sermon there, then he goes and visits another home on Sabbath afternoon? You can visit quite a few homes in one Sabbath afternoon. And even Sabbath morning. You know, you can reverse the time for Sabbath school and divine service. You can meet in one home and share the divine service there. And then they do Sabbath school after you leave. And what about the many capable lay members who are capable of preaching and teaching the gospel? We need to use every member in the church, give them something to do. And when you suddenly have a church of just a few people, suddenly everyone is needed. I remember one time we, our church had grown to, I think it was about 22 members or something like that. And I remember attending the reorganization of our church and there were some young people in the church and somebody proposed them to be a youth leader or a Sabbath school leader and they said, oh no, we can't have them. Why not? Because they are inexperienced. And sometime later, somehow we ended up dividing the group a little bit and there was about six or seven members in another area. They were traveling about an hour to come to church. And when they organized that church, those same two young people were elected Sabbath school and youth leader. Why? Because they had nobody else. And all I could say was, praise the Lord. Why? Because now they had something to do. Brethren, we need to be involved in those local churches, those local gatherings. We need them. Why? Hebrews 10, 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another so much the more as you see that day approaching. We need personal exhortation, not just through preaching. We need that personal experience. And when we're talking about exhortation, we're not talking about somebody going around looking at the flaws of everybody else. And unfortunately, that's what we conjure up as exhortation in our mind. In our High Calling, page 232, it says, Think of the Lord Jesus and His merits and His love. But do not seek to find the defects and dwell upon the mistakes that others have made. Call to your mind the things worthy of your recognition and your praise. And if you are sharp to discern errors in others, be more sharp to recognize the good and praise the good. Yeah, that's what we need to do. Yeah, when we see young people, they make a mistake. What do you do? You've given them a job to do. You um, have given them assignment, and they fail somehow in that assignment. What do you do? You help them out. I remember when I was working in construction, when I started working in construction, I didn't know anything about it. And my uncle gave me, I was working for my uncle there in Los Angeles, and he gave me the frame in a window. And I would frame that window in, and it was wrong. It was crooked. And so I had to tear it all out again and try again. And I tried every, several times. I spent the entire day on that little window. And finally he came there and said, let me give you a hand. In five minutes it was done. I was so discouraged. After hearing that, I thought, man, forget it. I will never be able to work on a construction site. And so I just began to give up. I figured, forget this. I'll never learn. And that evening when we went back to his house, he explained to me things and he gave me encouragement and he told me about his own experiences. 
And the next day I had to do another one like that in a few minutes. I had it done. And then I learned to love the, the building projects and everything else. I just learned to love it. Well, our young people need that type of encouragement. They need opportunities and they need encouragement. And so if we want to criticize, if you want to criticize something, let's continue there in our high calling. You may, if you criticize yourselves, find things just as objectionable as that which you see in others. Then let us work constantly to strengthen the most holy faith. My dear brethren, as we come to our conclusion of this series, of this seminar. You know, it's time for us to work together. It's time for us to take these opportunities that God has given to us to prepare for eternity. I think of John chapter 17, verse 21, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. God wants us to be in unity. The way we get to be in unity is when we begin working, when we begin thinking of serving others, and that brings us joy and happiness, and that is true education, and that prepares us for the eternity to come. And so as we are looking forward to this new year. Yeah, looking forward to another year that has come with all its challenges as we listen to the different seminars and the different departments. May the Lord help us that we may have that experience, that joy that Jesus had in serving others so that every single member of the church is actively involved in something. May the Lord help us that this may usher in a bright new future and lead us through some difficult times yet to come, but finally into eternity with our Savior where we can have happiness and joy forever is my prayer. Amen. Amen.